Hi everyone, it's the Comic Fan Man here coming at you with another video. And in today's video, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to talk about um, the new uh, Netflix um, Revolution, uh, Masters of the Universe Revolution show. And I wanted to do it uh, in the form of a little bit of a TED Talk podcast type situation. So I figured I'd put out all of my... I'll put out some of my uh, new Eternia Masterverse figures out. Um, uh, and most of them are in their classic forms, which I like, except for uh, Whiplash, who I do like his new Eternia look. So I figure I'd leave them as a backdrop while I speak my mind as a fan of Masters of the Universe since the 80s and to see how... Um, I feel that Netflix did with Revolution. All right, before we talk about Revolution, I think it's very important that um, we just very quickly revisit uh, my feelings toward Revelation. Now, um, unfortunately, I am of the camp uh, that Revelation... The Revelation series um, was a steaming pile of garbage. I understand that that could be a little abrasive and it can come off as very negative. However, I do feel that Kevin Smith really uh, pulled a bait and switch on the fans. He lied to the fans. Um, he promised that he was making a He-Man show. It turned out it wasn't a He-Man show. It was a Tila show, which is fine. I there Not that there's anything wrong with it being a Tila show, but he should have said that from the beginning because everybody was anticipating Tila becoming the sorceress. Um, there, there was no reason to hide, you know, or to bait and switch that to make it seem like, oh, no, this is a He-Man show and... He-Man was barely even in it. In fact, he was in it mostly as a joke for most of the times. He was most of the punchline um, when uh, when he wasn't there. And uh, the whole thing that they did, the fact that there's a whole political left and right, it was woke, it wasn't woke enough, it was feminist, it wasn't feminist enough, it was queer baiting the fact that those are the main talking points of the show kind of shows how poorly the writers handled this IP. This is a fantasy world where none of that should even be a topic. It should be a very simple good versus evil, heroes versus villains. All of that outside stuff was nonsense and Tila was all of the characters were like written super super disrespectfully to the way they were Tila was terrible she was just super abrasive and it was like she was a strong character in, in the 80s show but she wasn't like somebody who was raging all the time and and, and she was raging for all the craziest reasons in the show. Um, the fact that she got into all those arguments with with Adam about him being He-Man, even when he had died, I was just like, what is, who wrote this? So, um, and then there were some other story beats that were super awkward, um, destroying heaven, all of that was just kind of weird. Um, the way that uh, Evelyn's background was changed to where her parents were going to eat her. It was like, wait, so her parents chose to eat their own daughter instead of turning to like a life of crime, which would have made sense for her being a villain. Like it was, I, I just sat there and was like, somebody was high as hell when they wrote that. Mr. Kevin Smith. Um, and also the fact that um, Kevin Smith just kind of mistreated like Clownfish TV when they were just telling him, they were warning him, like, don't do what you're going to do. And he went ahead and did it. And then he threw them under the bus. And that was just all really like just 
out of control. So, yeah, the fact that all of that was part of Revelation just really killed that, killed those 10 episodes for me, killed that whole series for me. Um, I will say Powerhouse Animation was amazing. They did absolutely the best job they could with what they were given. Um, although you could see that they did cut some corners, uh, especially with like the uh, vehicles, like they did the 3D modeling and they just left it that way. That was really kind of jarring when you have the rest of it being 2D. Um, and then all of a sudden there's these 3D models out of nowhere. It was kind of like, mm, yeah, I think they just cut corners. So um, that was overall, uh, unfortunately for me, Revelation was really, really poorly done. So I want you to understand that. So that way, when I give you my opinions about revolution, you understand that that's my background. That's that's the feeling that I had when I saw Revelation. It was awful. It was God awful as far as I'm concerned. You know, I, if you enjoyed it, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, I never like want to take anybody's entertainment value away from them. But for me personally, as a fan from the 80s, it was awful. I will also put a link in the description of the um, the written, the fully written out revelation review that I did two years ago um, that I posted in uh, my Facebook group. I'll put that in the comments below uh, so that you can see exactly uh, if you want to, if you if you want to, you could go ahead and read Read that and um, see exactly how I felt about Revelation. So, now that I've covered that, let's talk about my feelings for Revolution. All right, so now that you know how I feel about Revelation, let's talk about how I feel about Revolution. Was Netflix able to save it? Were they able to pull it out of the fires that Kevin Smith put it into? I am happy to report that, yes, Revolution was absolutely amazing. It was everything that I wanted from the Revelation series. Um, it, I'm pretty sure it's everything that the fans would have wanted the first time around. I don't know if it's going to get the viewing that it, sh that it should have gotten um, because Kevin Smith went out of his way to burn the fan base, um, you know, and treat the fans like they were the ones that were wrong. This show very clearly shows that he was the one that was wrong because they went out of their way to literally fix everything that he did in that first season. Um I don't want to talk about spoilers yet. I will have a spoiler section in this video. So there will be spoilers in this video. That'll be the next section. But I just want to talk about how I felt while I watched it. There were three, uh, there were three points during the series that really, really, really hit me hard. Um, like gave me like, you know, that man, that like, Whoa, I'm about to man cry right now. <laughs> this is a little bit too much emotion that I was not expecting. And it was great. It was great to feel that for this, for the masters of the universe. I think that's what they wanted to do. Like, I could see what they wanted to do with Revelation, but the, the writing was just so bad that the execution was off. But in this one, the writing is so good. There are three, at least three, for sure three, uh, that I can call off that just like, bam, hit me right in the feels. And it just gave humanity to these characters. And you can relate to them, what they're feeling, what they're going through. That's what I wanted. That's what all the fans ever asked for. Um... And we got it here in Revol in Revolution. We definitely got it here. Um, and by the end of it, like 
you know, there are some choices that are made that's like, wow, that was, that was brave. That was bold. That subverted my expectation. And in a positive manner, not like, you know, just, oh, we're just going to kill He-Man off in this episode. Then we're going to uh, pretend like we killed him again in another episode. Like, it was like, all of that was just crazy. Um, you could tell, like, nobody, like, there was no editor in the room to, like, say, like, yeah, we're not doing that. You're going to piss off the fan base. In this one, for sure, for sure, for sure, I can almost guarantee my next paycheck that Mattel was definitely involved. They definitely did not take a backseat. I'm pretty sure Mattel did the Thanos. Fine. I'll do it myself. And that's just what it felt like. It felt like masters of the universe. It felt like a He-Man show. Um, all of the characters were, were doing things. Even the, like, you know, the side characters. They were, I'll, I'm going to say it. I'm going to be broke once Mattel starts releasing these figures. Because there are some designs that are just absolutely amazing in this show. And I'm definitely going out of my way to get as many of them as possible. This, the, um, I believe they're in wave 12 right now. Um, the one that has like the uh, battle armor He-Man and all. Like I'm, I skipped this one. I think the only, the only one I'm going to go after is maybe Mechanek and Keldor. Those two look really great. So I'm going to go after them. So I have New Eternia, Trapjaw, New Eternia, Man-at-Arms, uh, New Eternia, Mechanic, and uh, Revolution, Kel King Keldor. Those are the four I'm going after. I don't care about any of the other ones. Maybe Movie Evil Inn. I might actually, there might be five because Movie Evil Inn is in there. But after that, let me tell you, I'm going to talk about it in the spoiler section. There are some other designs in this that were out of this world. And I was like, yeah, I need those figures like now. Like Mattel needs to start making those. I'm sure they probably have them already made. But bro, this show definitely sold a bunch of upcoming figures. Because there are some designs in there that are amazing. Powerhouse Studios, bravo. That is me clapping. They did an animation on this that is bar none their best work. I said in Revelation that they obviously cut some corners um, because they used some 3D modeling on some of the vehicles and it looked really awkward with the 2D animation. They did none of that here. Whatever was 3D was still kind of cell shaded. Everything looked immaculate. Like all of the changes, the backgrounds, like you, there were there were things that they obviously used 3D for. Uh, they used computer graphics for, but it looked nothing like what they did in Revelation. Like they took real time and real care to animate this show beautifully. Um so even the animation was a major upgrade from Revelation. So that all being said, the story arc was wonderful. Like I said, it had some really beautiful heartfelt emotion in it. And it was tugging at your heartstrings and you were like rooting for the good guys and you were hoping for the triumph. And it just, this was everything that the Masters of the Universe should have been from the start. So that's just my overall in general feeling of revolution. Now we're going to start talking about spoilers in the spoiler section. So I'm going to put up a little alert just so that you know. And um, if you don't want to be spoiled, if you haven't seen it yet, definitely press pause and go check it out and then come back. But I'm going into the spoiler section. Oh, one other thing before I go into spoilers. Um, the 
the show Revolution is definitely a sequel to Revelation. But you do not need to watch Revelation to enjoy Revolution. You will absolutely understand all the story plot line without having to watch Revelation. This is a separate story arc. It does, it does mention that Revelation happened. They do mention a couple of things about Revelation that happened. But those are not important beats to this story arc. This story arc is a completely different story arc. And I, for me, I thought it was wonderful that they did this. Because you can actually enjoy Revolution without having to slog through uh, the first 10 episodes of Revelation. All you got to know is that, you know, Tila became the sorceress. And... Um, she has to fix something that Evelyn unfortunately did in the first uh, series. And that's it, really. Like, you don't need more than that. All right. So now let's go into the spoiler talk. All right. So spoiler talk. I'm going to just try to abbreviate, you know, everything down. Um uh, to little bite-sized chunks. Uh, Tila is the sorceress. Um, obviously, her mother had died. And uh, she took over as the sorceress of Castle Grayskull. For whatever reason, this is one of the plot points from Revelations. She can still be the sorceress outside of Grayskull when that has never been an issue. Bef that, that has never happened before. But whatever. I can overlook that. Um, so she's the sorceress. Evelyn was exiled for what she did, which she destroyed heaven. Um, and she was basically on the verge of destroying reality until Tila stopped her. So now she was paying penance by being the nurse, uh, the nurse aide to a very sickly and dying Granamir. Granamir, oh my God. They, Granamir was so spectacular in this. I love the way they did Gran Amir. His voice was amazing. And the way he spoke, uh, like the riddles that he gave, he was just animated beautifully. So Gran Amir is, and Gran Amir is definitely one of the figures that um, I am hoping comes out because I will definitely get that. And I don't know how big Mattel would have to make him. I'm pretty sure he's going to have to be fairly large. But I don't care as soon if they release him. Because I know that they 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 just um, put in for the rights for him uh, to create him as a figure. So if they release him for sure, Granamir is definitely on my list. Um, this, the, the, the Lynn, the good Lynn... Um, the way she looked, I loved her new look. So I will definitely get the new Lynn figure as well. The Sorceress Tila, as far as the Sorceress of Grayskull, I didn't like that look. Um, so I'm not going to bother with that figure. But they do go on to make her, um, they make her like the Sorceress of three of the three different staffs, which is the staff of Zor, which is the staff of Castle Grayskull. They made her the sorceress of the staff of Ka, which is the snake staff, the snake magic staff. And they made her the sorceress of Havoc. So she, she was able to possess the Havoc staff and that also changed her. So she had a couple of different looks, but the one that I want is that snake goddess Tila. Oh my God, that was amazing. She looked so, so crazy with the design that they gave her. I really do hope that that's a figure that's coming because I have said from day one when they started the Masterverse, I wanted a new Eternia Snake Goddess um, when they did the new, when they started with the new Eternia line. And if they're going to give it to us, as far as like, they'll give us the revolution version, I will go for it because it was a gorgeous, gorgeous design. Um, 
there was also the design for Too Bad. Too Bad was really cool when they when they gave him the Skeletech. Um, there is the King Keldor, which looks really good. So I am going to get that one. And then they also did a Skeletor 2.0, which was the Skeletech upgraded. That looks really good. I don't know how they're going to handle the special effects on the figure, but that Skeletor looked amazing. So I'm definitely, if they release that Skeletor, I'm definitely going to get him. And then there was the uh, He-Man 2.0. Holy cow. There's the Battle Armor He-Man, which was cool. Um, but I already have a Battle Armor He-Man. So I'm not going to bother with the new Battle Armor He-Man. Even though he does he does look a little cool. Um, but I'm not going to bother with him because I already have a Battle Armor He-Man. Um, but there is a He-Man in this toward the end that looks absolutely bonkers it's like he-man from this show mixed with the he-man from the cgi show because the logo is that same logo and he looks like king grayskull like he's got like the king grayskull look he's got this little uh like he's got his long hair but with like a like a top knot on his back oh my god he looked amazing his sword looked dope as hell. His armor looked bananas. <coughs> Excuse me. So that He-Man, I so am looking forward to seeing that He-Man. If they release that He-Man, for sure, that is a must-buy for me. Another figure to talk about is, is Man-at-Arms, Duncan Man-at-Arms. They changed him to something called Man of... Uh, instead of Man at Arms, because they made Andrew Man at Arms, they made him into Man at War. And his armor, oh boy, his armor was also like on another level. It was so beautifully designed with the white, the gold. He didn't have the green, but he had like a navy gray, um, like a military style gray in there. Oh man, he looked amazing. So, definitely the Man of War, Man at Arms Duncan will definitely be a must buy for me. Then there's the Horde. Hordak. Oh my goodness. Hordak was amazing. He's another must have figure. He, I'm sure if they do him, he's probably going to be a deluxe because he did everything like he did in the cartoon. He had the the uh, cannon arm he had the rocket legs crazy crazy stuff and he just looked amazing and let me tell you okay well let, let's go let's go through this episode by episode episode one you have he-man fighting scareglow with uh he-man and orko teaming up to fight scareglow to release the souls of fisto and clam champ this was a tie-in to Revelation um, because they unfortunately killed off Clam Champ and Fisto in a very stupid manner. But in Revolution, okay, fine, they got to go in. They want to rescue their immortal souls, and they do that. But um, when that happens, uh, at the end of it, because he exerted himself too much... It, it turned out that King Randor was dying. And that's why he wanted to kind of like go on this adventure. Because he knew that he didn't have any more time. So he wanted to be with his son. And so all of a sudden the, the realization is brought up to Adam that his dad is dying. Um, and it brings in this whole like scene that just oh my god it tugged at my heartstrings and it was it was a wonderful scene that you knew the writers knew what they were doing like that that scene of there's a scene where adam gives his eulogy if you take that scene and you put it up against the scene where battle cat was trying uh where cringer was trying to convince tila to be a hero in revelation like you could tell that is not the same writing team 
That scene where Cringer was trying to talk to Tila was just a stream of incoherent ideas that made no sense when you broke it down logically versus when Adam is talking about this, this thing that his father did that he didn't appreciate when he was a child and that he would give up everything to just have that moment with his father. Oh my God, that hit me so hard because I had a very similar experience at my mother's funeral. Like it just brought up all these memories of all these little things that like, I wish I hadn't done that or I wish I would have spent more time or things like that. And the fact that they knew that, 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 that the writers could bring that out of, that was amazing. So, and then that episode ends with Keldor coming back. Um, there is a whole scene in, say, in Snake Mountain where Skeletor is converting too bad. And there's, you know, that whole evil monologue of how the Horde is going to take over. And uh, Motherboard talks to Hordak. And that's where we hear that wonderful, soothing, deep, growling Keith David voice. And, it, and he also had the little, like, snort from Hordak, which was great. I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, but he was, his voice is so amazing and commanding. So, um, oh, and Motherboard was actually voiced by Meg Foster, uh, who was the evil in in the 1987 movie, which was really cool. <coughs> So that was really very nice. Goes into the next episode where Keldor is explaining where he's been and uh, what's been happening to him. And um, so he kind of talks Adam out of the being the king and himself into the throne. And it was an interesting story arc for Skeletor Keldor because... It turned out that Skeletor didn't even know he was Keldor. He thought that they had made up. He thought that the motherboard had made up the illusion of Keldor. But she said something and it triggered It triggered in him that he was like, wait a minute, Keldor was real? Wait a minute, I was Keldor? And there was a conversation. I think she was having another conversation with Hordak and Skeletor kind of interrupted. So she kind of like bashed him around a little bit. But in that thrashing that she gave him, she un unknowingly, she released Keldor from the mental shackle that they had put on Skeletor. So now Keldor was, was Keldor and Skeletor actually talking to each other about how they're going to take over. That was so neat. That was such a nice dynamic that I was not expecting. Um, William Shatner and... <laughs> You know, hearing Captain Kirk and Luke Skywalker talking to each other about taking over the universe is like, whoa, that's a little bananas. But it worked and they did an amazing job together. Um, and uh, so that was that was that episode. The third episode is where they get into, um, you know, now it starts to build up where Skeletor, Keldor... Uh, decide they're going to overthrow the Horde. Uh, we get a little bit of a backstory of, well, like a quick glimpse of when uh, Hordak uh, invaded Eternos the first time. It turned out he didn't want to attack Eternos because he was afraid of the power of Grayskull. Um, and we learned that we learned that later, but that was the reason why Hordak never went to Eternos. When he went there, he he lost. I don't know how he lost. They don't explain how he lost. But in his losing, you can definitely see there were two baby cribs in the room. There was uh, one plushy baby tiger next to one. And way off in the corner, there was a little unicorn, uh, like, riding uh, stick. And so you you know, and he was cradling something. They didn't show it, but you knew. Like it was like, oh, he he did take Adora in this one. So he has Adora. Um, and uh, but obviously, 
you know, whatever the rights are, it's between the the owners of She-Ra and all that. They're just not going. I don't know. Right now, they can't put She-Ra in it, but Despara might be might be uh, a way for them to get through uh, through that loophole. So then we get to like episode four, where it is a great, great battle. The horde comes. Oh, there's a scene where um, I believe Rockon was challenging a uh, Hordak. And it was like, whoa, there's rock on. That's crazy. And like he he builds his body out of rock around him. He, he goes to fight. And all of a sudden, the rest of the horde, Grizzlor comes out. Uh, Mantena comes out. Leech comes out. And they bust his ass. But it was great. It was great to see rock on. I was, I was not expecting that. That was also a great surprise out of left field. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't. It doesn't look like he survived, but at least he he was in it, um, and he did he did kind of go out heroically if he went out. So that was a nice surprise. But then episode four is when it really like it picks up. Like you find out that Skeletor like killed Motherboard in the craziest way. Like for an anime, it was straight up out of seven. That's all I'm going to tell you was in the box. It was straight up out of seven. Um, and then uh, and then he challenges Hordak. And it is, a f I, I thought they were going to do like the, like, oh, like he's going to stab him in the back or something. No, it, it, it was a straight up fight. And I was like, yes, this is awesome. Seeing Skeletor and Hordak actually duke it out. It was amazing, amazing, amazing. So I was so happy for that. And then that was done. And Skeletor like uh, ran him through. He, he got the drop on him. He made him understand that he can now use both magic and technology, which is something that Hordak couldn't do. And that's why he was afraid to attack Eternia because Eternia did have both. Um... So that was how he got rid of Hordak. But then um, Tila, in her part of the quest of the show, she went to go see Granamir to um, try to get the other staffs. Uh, she needed to know what it was that she needed to bring Praeternia back. So that way when uh, Adam's father dies, he gets to go to heaven, that she wanted to basically rebuild heaven. So, uh, Granamir tells her, like, she needs all three staffs. She needs the staff of Zord, the staff of Ka, and the staff of Havoc. So, um, he, Granamir, was the, was the defender of the staff of Ka. So he tests her for a little bit, and then he realizes that, yes, she is worthy. Uh, he gave her, f the final challenge was like a riddle, and she solved it. Um, so he granted her the Staff of Ka, which turned her into the beautiful snake goddess. Again, like I said, I hope that figure comes out, because that's the Tila I have been waiting for um, ever since they started this Masterverse line. Um, so she gets the Staff of Ka, she turns into the Snake Goddess. Uh, when Skeletor is fighting Hordak, Evelyn kind of gets the jump on him. And he thought that she was going to join him again, but she actually, uh, removed the Havoc Staff from his Techno Arm because, um, the Motherboard had, had mutated it into his arm. So she took it off and she took the Havoc Staff back to Tila. And then um, Tila was going to call all the powers together. She was trying to forge all the staffs into one. And it began to like turn her into like three different sorceresses at the same time. So it was kind of tearing her apart. Now, uh, another side um, thing was Orko and Gwildor. Gwildor was great. There was a line in there was a line in this show 
that shows that this is the Gwildor from the 1987 movie. Um, Man at Arms uh, shows up at his doorstep and he's like, yeah, you remember like that when we, we had our adventure through the universe and it took us to a different place? I was like, oh shoot, it is the it's the same Gwildor. It's not a different it's not like a new Eternia Gwildor. It's the Gwildor from the 1987 movie. So um so he charged Gwildor with taking the um the sword of power and upgrading it so that way it can fight off the, the techno virus that Skeletor is using to infect everybody. And he does that. Gwildor does that. He he got he got the uh, the sword together. He upgraded it and he gave it to He Man. Uh, they they got they got it back to He Man. The horde attacked them. Orko defended him, which was really cool. Um, but when they got back to the battlefield, they gave Adam the sword, and Adam rushed into the whirlwind that was uh, tearing Tila up, and. Uh, he he kept jumping and jumping and jumping until he got to her. Uh, he jumping off of like rocks that were floating around her until he got to her. And then um, when they got, uh, when she realized it was him, she kind of calmed herself down and she turned into the into the great into the sorceress of Grayskull, which was the Zor, the bird sorceress, and. Um, Adam called in the power, he turned into He-Man, and the, when he called in the power, that was the power that she was missing, was the other half of the, of the power, because she only had the raw power, Adam has the controlled power, because um, that was why he can become He-Man, uh, is because through the sword, he can control it, when he doesn't have the sword, that's when he becomes the Hulk He-Man. So with the sword, because he can control the power, that was a he he was holding on to Tila, so Tila was able to control her power. And the and the change that they went through was amazing. Now, they called Tila the the tri sorceress because her staff became an amalgamation of Zor, Ka, and the Havoc staff mixed together. And it looked great. I loved the way it looked. However, I did not really like Tila's look all that much. I I know that probably they will release her in that look. But I personally, for me, what I want is that snake goddess Tila. Because that snake goddess Tila was, it looked amazing. So that's the Tila that I'm hoping for. But the the tri sorceress Tila that that did look really cool i'm not gonna i'm not gonna front it did look cool it just wasn't like when you see the snake goddess Tila and then you see that Tila it's like eh, okay but that was when he-man turned into he-man 2.0 after skeletor killed um hordak he turned into skeletor 2.0 he calls himself skeletor 2.0 and he looked amazing because he was like Skeletor mixed with some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like nanotechnology. Like he looked amazing. So like it was his magic plus nanotechnology together. But He-Man looked like, you know, like a King Grayskull. He just looked amazing. And uh, again, I, I'm hoping Mattel's got that figure lined up because that's definitely a figure that I'm going to get. Um... And they have an epic battle um, between Skeletor and He-Man again. Um, while the sorceress was focusing her power to recreate heaven. And it was just, it was great. There was, uh, Skeletor called up the Techno Titans. Um, which was like the, the Titans from, um, well, you know, in, in the old, in the old um, comic storylines. Like those Titans were part of like the um, the story arc of Hero, um, where he had the like the dinosaurs, but they were they were tech they they had tech technology advancements to them. Um, that was the that was the toy line that was canceled. So Skeletor calls up all these Titans, and now all the heroes have to deal with those Titans. 
And there's one Titan that was way too powerful for everybody. And he was going after the sorceress Tila to stop her from creating heaven. And he he's about to get there. And Granamir comes out of nowhere, fully armored. Oh my God, that scene was amazing between him and that that um, that Titan. And that also led to another scene that was just... Uh, the 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 titan and um granamir does finally kill the titan but the titan did land his death blow on granamir and it led to another scene that just like it left you with goosebumps when granamir was talking it um i was just like oh my goodness when he was talking to evelyn and he's like no now you're you're good lynn um you're you're a very very good lynn oh my goodness that just like that was so touching to me the way the way that scene played out um and then um then the final battle between he-man and skeletor <coughs> skeletor uses his techno magic to to bind he-man and he's about to finish him off and i don't know where comes the like i guess it's the force ghosts of king randor and he helped He-Man um, fight back. You know, I know that I know I can already tell like a lot of there's going to be the, you know, the normal YouTubers that are going to say, oh, this is Force, this Star Wars bullshit, blah, 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 this, that and the other. Listen, Tila was bringing heaven back. She was bringing back all of those spirits. They needed heaven to be tethered to Eternia. They were floating off and being forgotten, and eventually they were going to dissipate. <coughs> so you can say Force Ghost, this, that, or the other, Star Wars, blah, blah, blah. But it made sense. That's what I'm talking about. Like the writing in this one, everything led to something else. It wasn't just a random this out of nowhere or a random that out of nowhere. Like everything led to something. Um... Evelyn had to train um, Tila on how to use the snake magic because Tila has never tapped into that part of herself before, or her passions. That's what the snake magic was, was about the passions. So she has never tapped into that. And she has a dialogue with her that was like, holy, like she is picking a fight with Tila. And like once Tila got like so worked up and she realized, okay, like now you got to start bringing it back. You got to control your passions. I was like, yo, that was crazy. But she literally tells her, she's like, I know you're jealous of me because I'm the one that raises He-Man's loincloth and you're not. You're just the one in the background hoping that he sees you. I was like, oh, shoot. She's throwing a lot of shade at this girl. The writing in this show was far superior not even close to what it was in Revelation. And I am so thankful for it. Um, He-Man does finally get the drop on Skeletor. And um, he runs him through with his new sword. And his new sword absorbs all the techno virus magic into it. Leaving Keldor. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, but he left Keldor. So Skeletor is now sort of banished. Um, Skeletor is now in He-Man's sword. Um, and Keldor is all that's left. And that was how it's ended. Um, then there was a, there was a scene where um, He-Man, again, gives this very big emotional speech about um, he's not going to take the throne. He's actually... Um, um, he's actually doing away with uh, the royalty um, that he wants the people of Eternia to uh, basically become um, democratic, uh, that they'll vote for their leaders. They don't have to be told what to do, that they can now um, vote and, you know, all that jazz. I guess they'll have to set up some kind of government that way. Um Andra it looks like Andra is going to run for, you know, first president of Eternia. I'm okay with that. I don't care. Like, you know, it is what it is. And it looks like um, he, oh, and finally, He-Man and Tila do have their kiss, which was great. 
and um, it looks like they're going to go and be the champions of Grayskull. They're going to go and live in Grayskull. Um, while the people of Eternia uh, begin to learn to rule themselves um, with a democratic style government. And you know what? I know that there's going to be people that are going to say, like, you know, this is woke, that's woke, la la la, woke, woke, woke. Look, it makes sense. He man, not that He Man can't be king. Yes, he could be king. He has been king in, in previous things. But, like, you know, this for me it was just like he it is kind of true that the kings are kind of tied to their throne they can't be leaving their throne vacant um so you know he gets to stay as the champion the protector of eternia and you know he's giving the 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 people a chance to rule themselves that i'm sorry i I know there's going to be woke this, that, or the other, but I, I thought that was a really proper ending because it gives kind of everybody what they want. Like, you know, Andre is going to be an important person in Eternia. Like, He-Man gets to stay with Tila, Adam, and Adam He-Man gets to stay with Sorceress Tila in, in Grayskull. Um... You know, I don't know what's going on in Snake Mountain. Oh, that was... Oh, I'm sorry. I also skipped something really quick. He-Man attacked Snake Mountain. And I was like, holy shit. I was not expecting that. Keldor literally talked He-Man into attacking Snake Mountain. And he fucked shit up. <laughs> that was crazy. But, um, but in any case, you know, what He-Man did was he gave the people a chance to rule themselves. And I, I thought that was really kind of neat. Um, you know, so we'll see where it goes. I don't think they're going to be doing anymore because Ted Biaselli himself said in a couple of YouTube interviews that he's done uh, with other YouTubers that uh, Netflix only greenlit five episodes. And let me tell you, if this is the only five episodes they get, I am happy. Yes, there were a couple of stingers at the end where Evelyn becomes one of the comic cosmic enforcers like Zodak uh, because of what she did. That was really cool. And then they showed uh, Dispara um, regenerating Hordak. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure they would like to do the Dispara, but that's going to lead into She-Ra. So I don't know how they can really handle that. So if they do nothing else, I am happy with Revolution. I am happy to say it was amazing and that it was definitely worth the watch. Um, and you don't need to force yourself to watch Revelation to enjoy Revolution. Revolution you can enjoy on its own. So I hope you enjoyed this. I know this is a bit of a long video. I don't normally do long videos, but I felt like it was very important to get this out as a fan of He-Man since 1982. Um, I do, I am collecting Masterverse and I do have a bunch of the vintage figures still. I have my Snake Mountain, uh, Origins, Castle Grayskull, and I still have my vintage Castle Grayskull. Um, you know, I love this. I mean, I've, I even painted a little bit of the Castle Grayskull. Like, I love Motu. So, I love Masters of the Universe. So, when I saw Revelation, it broke my heart. But Revolution, wow, amazing, amazing job, and I am so happy. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this helps you decide whether or not you're going to watch it. Again, this is from a real fan of the show. Now, I'm not like a YouTuber who doesn't know anything about Motu. I know Motu. I know Masters of the Universe. Um, I've, written, I've written my own fan fictions. Um, and I, like I said, I wrote a very long and concise review of Revelation. Um, and I did not like it. But Revolution is definitely ah, chef's kiss. It was so worth it. I'm so happy for it. Thank you, Netflix. Thank you, Mattel. Thank you for fixing what Kevin Smith did and getting this show to us. All right. If you enjoyed this, please give me a like and subscribe. 
and look forward to my next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.